This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. Hi, um, I am Jim Reviewer. I am going to talk today about self-hosting beyond uh, the WordPress website. Um, I am known as HeroZ on all the socials and um, down at the bottom if you want a copy of these slides, uh, I have a link to share uh, down below. So who am I? I am, uh, my day job right now is a WordPress uh, full stack developer for Stat News, which is a life sciences and medical publication from Boston Globe Media Partners. Um, my previous life was at uh, a agency in Providence um, known as OOMF, um, where there I worked as a, both a WordPress developer and a DevOps uh, engineer which is where I gained a lot of my uh, Linux and, well, not a lot of Linux experience. I've been doing that forever. Um, but a lot of my server-side experience. Um, and because of them, I've got a lot of experience with those, uh, with building web servers and, and all that jazz. Um, so what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about um, the pros and cons between hosting your website uh, from the server-side up uh, versus um, self-hosting just your website itself. Um, and if I haven't scared you off with that, how to look for hosting, like what some suggestions I've got. Um, I'll do a quick demo of uh, setting up a LAMP stack on, um, on a server. Uh, LAMP stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. And then if I have any time, um, I'll do some questions. All right, so uh, why not share hosting? Um, why not use like a HostGator or GoDaddy or something like that? Well, shared hosting means that you are on the same server as, your IP address is on the same server, your site is on the same server as a bunch of other sites. Um, I, for, uh, for this demo, I went on to a site called You Get Signal, which does a reverse IP lookup, and finds and um, looks at other server, other websites that are on that same uh, domain on that same IP address. And um, for Boston WP, there are 20, 216 um, other sites that are on there. And that little red box, I don't know if you can read it, says um, maybe hosting one or more websites with explicit content. So you need to, you, 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 you need to like, you don't know who your neighbors are. But why does that, why does that really matter? Well, um, shared person, Shared server means shared resources. So um, it's uh, one web server, it's one email server, it's one database server. Um, if uh, you know, Boss Pancake House, which is on the same server as you, um, has a lot of traffic one day, you get slash dotted, the kids still do that, um, they could take up a lot of resources that will detract from your site. So your um, site and uh, server impact or your website in, uh, responsiveness can be impacted by another site. Um, same with email. Since email, a uh, lot of shared hosting has email on, um, you know, on, your, on your same server, um, if another website either gets hacked or becomes a um, spam magnet or a spam uh, Disseminator, um, you could get blacklisted because it's IP based for some places. Um, same with the database, um, not as common, but um, if someone gains root access, hacks a one person's database, gains root access, there is a chance that they could get onto your database. Um, so the actions of other sites could have um, kind of dire repercussions to yours. Um, on the other, I mean, the other um, side for that, other than like, you know, not the other, uh, like trusting your neighbors, um, you're responsible, you're um, subjected to the benevolence of your host. So, say for example, um, you want to try out Node, because all the kids are using that today, and you want to try that with REST API. If your host doesn't provide Node access or Python or Ruby, you're kind of out of luck. Um, and you only need control over what your little domain, your little, your little uh, 
hosting area. Um, okay, so what about word processing? What about like WP Engine or Page Leader? Any of those? Um, same with same reasons as above. Um, they might be a little bit better with uh, security and whatnot, um, but in, there are more restrictions on WordPress hosts because they only give you really control of your WP contact directory and plugins and themes and your uploads. Um, they control like the WordPress install, they control all of that stuff. Um, they can also be a little bit more uh, expensive. Um, and the prices are based on, excuse me, on a combination of visits and space and bandwidth. Um, uh, server hosting does also rely on bandwidth for, um, for metrics and stuff, but um, they might be a little bit more, a little more generous. Um, so those are the downsides, but what are the, what are the benefits? So, um, you know, it's, it is hands-free. It is, you know, all you're worried about is your own site and your own code. Um, uh, they used to offer 99% off time. Um, you know, if you, if you serve your own, uh, you know, if you host your own server and whatnot, you're responsible for that time. Um, I think that I had something else, but I forget, sorry. Um, all right, so what about complete self-hosting? So what, is, what does that mean? What is that, um, why would you want to do that? Well, for one thing, you have the power. Um, you are responsible for and can make sure that you have the right, um, you know, your updates are timely. You're not, you're not like hoping that your host is, is up to date with, um, you know, security and, and whatnot. Uh, you can tune your site, uh, tune your server to your site, meaning um, if you need to like kind of tweak the max client settings or, or um, uh, you know, give uh, MySQL a little bit more uh, resources than uh, than Apache, um, you can do that. You don't have to rely on your host for that. Um, one IP address. Um, you have one IP address for your server. And you are respond. You have that one IP address that is assigned to your site, which means if you went to um, that previous slide and put in your URL for that site, one site shows up. for that site. One site would show up, um, which you know keeps you know uh, keeps you off the blacklists. Um, you would do have the ability to tie in other technologies such as Node, such as Python, Ruby. Um, you can play with those those new technologies or enhance your site with that. Um, because you have um, access to the server, you have access to run uh, CLI scripts like WPCLI, which is a very powerful WordPress tool um, for uh, you, know, make, you know updating your site and, and whatnot without going through the front end. And you can also increase performance by setting up multiple servers. Um, you could have your web server on uh, you know, one server and your database on another server, and if you want to play with another, you can get another server, and they can all talk to each other as one big happy family. Um, but there are downsides, of course. Um, because you have the power, you also have the keys of the castle, uh, meaning that you are responsible for updates and security patches and, and all that stuff. You need to keep on top of that stuff. Um, you're responsible for performance. So if your site does get slashed out it, or Tumblr, um, a, you're responsible for making sure that you've got enough bandwidth to, to make sure that you can uh, take care of that. And because of all that, you could lose sleep. Um, I have spent many of sleepless nights trying to tune servers to make sure that stuff is is uh, is optimal. All right, y'all are still here, so I haven't scared you off. So, what are what are your options? Where could you go to to get started with this type of thing? Um, I have a few suggestions for uh, hosts. Um, these are ones that I've used or um, have no people use them. One is DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is um, really, really cheap, and you can start up a server really, really fast. Um, they start at like uh, $5 for a, a very small server, um, go up to like 100 servers for multi-core and whatnot. Um, this animated GIF that I um, so graciously uh, stole from their site shows how fast you can spin up multiple sites at once, servers at once. 
Um, they offer these um, something called one-click applications, uh, meaning you could um, find a, a, a LAMP server, um, there's a pre-built server, so a LAMP server, a node server, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, and be up, you know, get up and running faster instead of doing the install yourself. Um, a lot of these provide automatic backups. Um, DigitalOcean provides a backup of, like a snapshot of your server, so if something goes south, you can go back and, um, and you know, restore a, a, a backup. Um, they offer lots of different distributions like CentOS, uh, Ubuntu, Debian, uh, 3DSD, and stuff. And the community, the community is fantastic. They have tons of tutorials on everything that you could possibly think of, um, such as uh, how to build a LAMP stack, how to um, set up uh, monitoring tools, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in fact, you can get paid for writing a tutorial if they accept it. Um, the downside to DigitalOcean is the support is quite limited. You're responsible for everything inside the server. Um, they will not, you know, they will not go in and, and gain root access and, and access your server. Um, you're responsible. Your um, your only recourse for that is like the community that they have, as well as um, how good your Google Foo is. Um, they will support. Um, their hardware and, and what contains your virtual private server. Um, the next one I have on the list is Linode. They've been around a little bit longer than uh, DigitalOcean. Um, they have a rather unique uh, way of, um, of their plans. Uh, they choose it on um, memory and disk size, and then you can put as many servers you want within that memory limit um, and, and amount of disk size. Um, you can expand it and whatnot. Um, so you can do multiple servers within one like central plan. They also have a lot of tutorials which are focused on, um, which are kind of Linode focused, but they have more general ones as well. Um, and like I said, they've been around for, for a good long time. Um, AWS, um, you probably use, you probably use Amazon Web Services and not even know it. A lot of the uh, a lot of startups use them because it's very easy to spin up and destroy um, web servers, uh, Amazon Web Services, um, EC2 instances. I'm talking about specifically. Um, lots of options. Um, they start with like a free, like micro instances, really really low bandwidth, really really low power, to much bigger uh, instances. Um, I think you can also do Windows on AWS as well. Um, their pricing is based on uh, pennies per hour, but the amount of pennies that they charge per hour is based on the size of the instance that you choose. So it can be really cheap, it can be really expensive. And if you've ever seen the web services panel, it is massive and daunting and huge um, because they offer a ton of different, a ton of different options, uh, database and um, EC2 and just plain on storage. Um, you have to uh, kind of understand the Amazon lingo to kind of to figure out what they what they offer. Um, and last but not least is uh, Rackspace. Um, Rackspace is kind of the Cadillac of VPS hosting. Um, they offer a lot of other stuff like uh, physical hardware and whatnot. Um, they offer managed support, um, meaning they will actually dive into your machine, find out what's wrong, um, and you actually pay for that. Um, on each of these slides, I have a link to the pricing plans. Um, this one is a calculator, which is um, like you say, okay, I need this much bandwidth, I need this much space, and it spits out a uh, uh, rough price. Um, I did not mention any any of the other hosts, the tons of hosts out there, like HostGator or um, H2 or something like that, GoDaddy. Um, a lot of those shared providers also offer uh, self-hosting or uh, server hosting as well. Um, the prices vary. Um, I only wanted to show ones that I've had personal experience with. Um, so you could, if you're happy with like the service that your provider provides, your host provides, and you want to do self-hosting on server side, you can reach out to them and um, see what they offer and what their prices are. Okay, so um, you've got your 
place that you're going to put your, you know, your, where you're going to host your server, um, you're all ready to like just dive right in and, and create your server and, and get rid of your shared hosting. Um, but how do you how do you get started? How do you like get some get some info? Um, well, the first thing you want to do is you kind of want to pick a distribution. Um, there are tons of Linux distributions out there. There are some very baseline ones um, that you like do everything from the ground up, like Slackware or Gentoo. Um, there are ones that pretty much like you throw on the USB stick and boom, you have a desktop like Fedora and, and Ubuntu. Um, these are three that I have used and have the most experience with. The first one is Ubuntu. Um, they are the most popular distro out there since they've uh, started. They, um, just about every tutorial that you'll see is how to do X with Ubuntu, how to install X with Ubuntu. Um, a lot of the DigitalOcean tutorials are Ubuntu based as well. They do offer other distros, but you know, nine times out of ten you'll find them for Ubuntu. Um, Ubuntu's release cycle is every six months, meaning um, they come out with a new version of, quote unquote, version of Ubuntu every six months. Um, their number of conventions are the version of the release plus um, a, with a dot .04 or .10. 04 means it was released in April. 10 means it was released in October. Um, it being April, they just released uh, 6104, which is Xenial Cirrus. Their naming convention is um, they you know go up the alphabet and they pick a very obscure animal and then put a obscure name in front of it. So Xenial is this month's um, uh, 16.10 is actually Yakety Yak. They went there. Um, but what they do with the um, every other .04 release is uh, they make this one a long-term support release, which means this one has support for five years, and they refresh those every two. So uh, 14.04 is the previous release. That's Trusty, I forget the handle. Um, Trusty is available for another three years of support. Um, so that means there's also an overlap between one and the other. Um, and like I said, tons and tons and tons of tutorials. Debian is the next. Um, they are one of the oldest. They're one of the founding. You know, they're they're like when you think of Linux, you think Debian is one of them. Um, Ubuntu is actually based off of Debian, um, so they have the same package management. Means the same way that they install software is the same. Um, Debian has three tracks um, for their software releases: unstable, which by the way that's what Ubuntu is based off of. They're based off of Debian unstable, um, and then. Uh, that is where the um, you literally live by the seat of your pants, and um, you can install all of these distros on, on a machine and try them out. Unstable um, is like that. It, it's like you're you're expecting your machine to break. Um, this is where they like get made, the major bugs taken care of. Um, oh, and also by the way, Debian's name convention is based off of Toy Story characters. So Debian Unstable is Sid, which is the kid that destroys all the toys. And that's always going to be Sid. Um, uh, the testing branch is the next level up, and that is where um, they get more people to test the um, test software, um, make sure that it's, uh, you know, all the bugs are ironed out. Um, and this year, this branching, this testing branch is named Stretch for the octopus, which I didn't even know there was an octopus in Toy Story. And the stable branch um, is like that is where you want to, that's what you want to install on your server. And that one is named Jesse after the cowgirl. Um, so, like I said, it's, it's been around for a very long time. It's, the stable branch is just that, it's extremely stable. Um, which also means that the software in there is kind of long in the tooth. So, you're not going to see PHP 7 in, in uh, Debian stable for a little while. It doesn't mean you can't install it. There's probably tutorials for installing PHP 7 on top of stable, but um, it's not the like you know seal of approval uh, type of stuff. Um, because Ubuntu and Debian are based off the same package management, um, a lot of the Ubuntu tutorials work for uh, Debian. Um, you might run into some issues where um, something that's very specific, like specific software designed for Ubuntu, might not work on Debian, but 
Google is your front, basically. Um, and last but not least is CentOS. And CentOS is, um, uh, so long, long ago, Red Hat was, uh, Red Hat was born, and they decided at some point to go commercial. Um, so a lot of enterprise, uh, uh, a lot of enterprise offerings provide, um, uh, use Red Hat for that because it has a support package and all that stuff. Well, they also wanted to allow an open source version as well of Red Hat, and that was CentOS. Um, there's also the like dead and <laughs> unstable version of the Red Hat umbrella called Fedora. Um, so stuff gets into Fedora. Um, and a lot of people test it, get the tires, use it on the distro, and when it's like fully baked and really stable, it goes into CentOS and Red Hat. Red Hat and CentOS share the same, a lot of the same libraries, so you get for free what a lot of people pay a lot of money for. Um, it's also very, very stable, and it, I would not be surprised if the lion's share of your shared hosting providers are on CentOS. Um, the other reason is CentOS is supported for 10 years. So um, CentOS 5 is still supported, 6 is still supported, 6.5 is still supported. Um, they're up to 7.1 now, and it's supported for 10 years of its release. Um, Debian is more haphazard in its um, release schedule. Um, they don't say we're going to do this for X amount of years. They do it as like, okay, all of this stuff in testing is stable, and we're going to freeze testing, make sure it looks good, and then it turns into the next version. And that can be anywhere from, like, you know, two years to 20. Um, all right, so now you've got your distribution, you've settled on something that you want to learn about. Um, now it's time to, like, sign up for DigitalOcean, right? Uh, you might want to hold off and try, uh, try practicing with Vagrant. Um, Vagrant is a, um, a way of spinning up, destroying, and playing around with um, uh, different operating systems. Um, it's what I use in my day job every day for a development environment, and because of that, there's a lot of support for it. So this animated GIF that I'm, that I'm showing is actually going through um, creating a base init, um, modifying the Vagrant file to um, use uh, Ubuntu's distribution. And now it's downloading the um, downloading the what they call the Vagrant box, which is a, a packaged virtual box um, instance. Um, what this allows you to do without like you know without destroying your current site is literally kicking the tires, and you can um, you can find uh, different uh, recipes of Vagrant files. Excuse me for. Um, for um, for just about anything you're looking for, if you want to like find a lamp stack, you just go into Google, say Vagrant lamp, and the operating system you're looking for, the distribution you're looking for, and someone out there has created uh, lots of someone's probably out there has created something. Um, WordPress specifically for Vagrant, there is varying varying Vagrants, um, which is based off of Cento. Uh, it is CentOS. No, it's not. It's about to. Um, but it uses Nginx for its uh, web server. Um, someone has devised a, an Apache version of that, which is a little bit easier to, to deal with um, sometimes than Nginx. Nginx. Um, and there's a lot of other different versions. Um, at the end of uh, the very last slide, there's another uh, link to, uh, shared link that I have for um, a list of resources. Vagrant is one of those resources that I have listed. So now you're ready to do this. You're ready to go. Um, well, I have a, like one word of caution. Um, there is something you're going to see in every single tutorial called sudo. Um, sudo is God writes on a server. Um, this is like this is like you're in Doom. You turn on, you hit the drop down, you hit God mode, and you can destroy everything with no kill you. That's basically that's basically sudo. Um, it elevates your, your rights to a root user, and you have access to every single file. You can delete anything, you can add anything, you can install anything you want. Um, oh, by the way, this XKCD is an obligatory, um, 
Like if I didn't put this in my slide, if I was talking about Zendo, my DevOps card gets revoked. So it has, it has to go in there. Um, the link down at the bottom there, if you go, to, if you grab my slides, uh, the link down at the bottom there is a more in-depth explanation of, of pseudo. So now, would you know about pseudo and all this stuff? Now we can actually do an install. So this is the Vagrant install that I um, that I uh, set up, and the link in there is the DigitalOcean uh, tutorial for how to create a LAMP stack. And for the miracle of modern science. Um, I am SSHing into the Vapor box. This is the demo time, by the way. Um, and I'm going to do a, if I can type, um, I'm going to do an app get update, which grabs the latest versions of all the software. Um, and this is all real time. I haven't like, taken out any slides, so this might take a little time. Um, so the next thing I did was an app get upgrade to make sure I had everything that was already installed up to date. Um, went out to the tutorial, copied and pasted um, this command. Um, I'm not sure how well y'all can read that, but it says sudo apt-get install um, Apache MySQL, PHP, and all the, the sundry items that are in there. I would actually add a couple more for WordPress, like uh, PHP 5G, um, which is uh, graphics library and stuff like that. But that's basically it. So apt-get, you can chain stuff together and install everything at once. So next, um, it's going to ask me. This is this is what you asked me to install. Is this what you want to install? Are you sure this is everything you want? Um, because you can see, like, there's one line that I put in, but there's like a ton more stuff that's going to install. Um, because what um, what the the app get packaging does is it looks for um, any dependencies that are needed. And Fedora and CentOS do the same thing, or it looks for dependencies and says, okay, you asked for Apache. Well, in order to do Apache, I need this and this and this and this and this. So we're going to continue and say yes. And now it's downloading everything. Um, this is basically like, this is what I used to do. Now it's going to ask you if there's any passwords, any, any things that's needed to install, to set up while it's in, uh, installing the server. So that was asking for my SQL password. And oh man, this is fun, right? Um, it's setting up my SQL right now. It's setting up um, Apache's downloaded. I see PHP 5 Minecraft, et cetera, et cetera. While this is running, anyone have any questions for me? We need more questions afterward, but yes, no, maybe so. Okay. Um, so uh, over here, Joe. Yes, yes. Just to clarify, you said uh, Ubuntu runs off of um, Debian unstable or stable? Unstable. Um, no, not necessarily. Um, just because it's based off of Debian Unstable doesn't mean that Ubuntu itself is unstable. Um, the long-term releases, Canonical, which is the parent company um, that, that manages Ubuntu, um, they go through their own set of testing and they go through, they do some tweaks to make it, you know, Ubuntu as opposed to Debian. So they'll do, um, uh, they'll do um, their own testing and, and making sure that everything looks right before they continue on. Um, okay, so the install it has finished everything. Um, I typed in a command to make sure the database was all set um, for MySQL, and now I am going through this script called um, what's the name? Uh, MySQL um, setup installation. I think is the name, um, which basically goes through a bunch of menu, uh, a bunch of uh, standard stuff like um, changing the root password, um, getting rid of uh, the anonymous user. Uh, making sure that you can't log in as root remotely, um, getting rid of the test databases, and then reloading the privileges um, so that those those changes got into effect. Um, last but not least, there's a couple more tweaks to Apache. Um, does it? There we go. Um, so I'm using. <coughs> Modifying the um, oh, because it's WordPress, we want to make sure that um, the index.php file is first in the list. So I'm using uh, VI 
uh, around them to, to make that change. Um, there's another uh, editor called Nano, um, which is a little bit easier to use, or you can like, um, you know, be of the opposing camp and choose Emacs, but I won't talk to you. Um, uh, so after all this, um, it's going to create that, you know, restart the Apache server, and voila. Um, now you can, from here, you can go to your machine and should be on localhost and you'll see your Apache login page. From that point forward, you can create your, you know, go into your bar.html folder and, uh, you know, install WordPress and all that stuff. Since this is a WordPress talk, I have to talk about WPCLI. And WPCLI, like I said, is a very, very powerful command line tool for um, installing and maintaining and upgrading WordPress from the command line. Um, sometimes that's a lot faster than going from the admin itself because you're not um, you're not going through Apache and then going to PHP. You're going directly to PHP and running commands that way. Um, it's I mean this is like critical for for uh, for my day job to to have access to CLI. Um, and that green button that's right there, um, the the maintainer of WPCLI is doing something to make um, the REST API and WPCLI work in harmony, which is exceedingly exciting. So I have some parting words. Um, so once you have all the stuff and you're, you're, you're confident that you want to go down the path of self-hosting from the server side up, um, just make sure you do your backups, you know, make sure that you, you've got the plan set to backup frequently, you can do snapshots as well. Um, keep up to date on the updates, keep abreast of those updates, um, if there's any great security updates, any of that stuff, you can install as well. And um, keep track of the logs. You don't need to use a third party to do that, but I've given some options as well. Um, of the three, New Relic is the one I've really only had the most experience with, but showing only one is there to do that. Um, Amon is, so New Relic and Amon, are, all three of them are free. Prometheus is open source, and that's why the SoundCloud guy is for monitoring. Um, Amon and New Relic have both a free and a paid version as well. And that's all I got. Are there any other questions? Yes? So we did something like this, and we were, where we got stuck was we have a new site, and how do we, how do you take this back up Your backup was like one big tar file of yeah. fun. Exactly. Um, was the problem moving it from point A to point B, or actually untarring it on the new server? Point B, we just don't know what to do with it. Where to untar it so that it can, all the files are found and kind of look the same. Um, I'm going to be in the happiness where I could probably like this. This is a little little specific for you guys, so um, we can like. More in depth. I guess I would ask you just more of you know, the general approach. So I've got a site, now I'm building a new site. Right. Are there certain tools you recommend to get um, your site to take like So there's just some basic, I mean, just basic Linux utilities. Instead of tarring up your site, like tarring up your data, going from one to the other, um, you can use something called rsync, which would um, you start on one server and you basically you're syncing, you're doing a synchronization of your files from point A to point B. Um, you just need to know the destination of point B. So if it's your standard Apache or um, Nginx, most of the times at bar .html, www slash html. Um, once you put it there, that's fine. That that would work. Um, the other step is to go into MySQL and do a database export. Um, it is a WordPress site and it's a, um, and a WPCLI installed. You can go into your the directory for your WordPress install and type uh, WPDB export and it will export everything to a file. You don't need to know the, database, the, the MySQL ID and password, it's all right there. Um, from that, that file you would copy over to the new server and um, you unfortunately can't use uh, 
WCLI to import the database? That's not true. If you have a base WordPress install already put on there, you can use WPCLI to import the new database. Um, there's another um, uh, another utility in WPCLI called Search Replace. So if you were, we do this all the time from like our dev install to our local where we, the URLs are different. Um, WPCLI's Search Replace will actually go through every single table and search and, and replace those uh, URLs for us. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Anyone else? Yes. If I'm watching this presentation, I think, you know, this is cool, but I'm new to Linux. Do you recommend any resources to get started uh, learning Linux? Uh, let's see. Um, DigitalOcean's tutorials are really good. Um, the Linux Foundation also partnered with um, edX to do a Linux 101. Um, I went through part of it and couldn't finish it because a lot of what they talked about, I was, I was waiting for them to get to the nitty gritty and like the first chapter or three was like the history of Linux and stuff. So if you get through that stuff, <laughs> um, then you can uh, get a, a foundation, a, a good foundation of Linux and, um, and that stuff from like an official Linux source. Um, O'Reilly books are pretty good. Um, a lot of the O'Reilly's maybe a little bit, they're very high level, but I know they have some Linux intros. Um, and then DigitalOcean tutorials are like phenomenal. Um, a lot of those, a lot of those have like very low level to very high level tutorials. Anyone else? Anyone? No? Cool. Um, I'll tweet out the the slides and the resource docs that I've got um, linked in here as well. Um, if there's nothing else, thank you very much.